Synoptic charts, such as those published freely by the Met Office in the UK, are a great resource for sailors. However, the default view, colour, can lead you to miss their most useful feature for both sailors and airmen. This is because the nice Met Office logo up at the top left, along with the details of the chart validity period, covers something much more useful. You can get to this easily enough though, simply select black and white and see what happens. As you can see, we uncover a rather interesting looking geostrophic wind scale. Let's have a closer look at that. So the heading says it all. This scale gives the geostrophic wind in knots for four hectopascal intervals as depicted by these curved lines on the graph. Now the intervals they're talking about is the gap between the depicted isobars on the chart. On the left of the scale is lines of latitude in 10 degrees, so 40 north, 50 north, 60 north and 70 north. Lines of latitude are curved on this type of map projection, which appears to be polar stereographic, although it isn't labelled. The lines of latitude are often not labelled either, so you do need to know the latitude you're interested in in order to use this scale. The curved lines on the wind scale represent geostrophic wind speeds. We all know that the closer together the isobars are, the windier it will be, and this helps us to remember how to use this scale. So we start at the left, and on the point representing the latitude you're interested in, the further right you go, according to isobar spacing, the lower the geostrophic wind gets, which makes sense. The curves are because of the fact that the further from the equator you get, the lower the geostrophic wind is for a given isobar spacing. So the same distance between isobars at 40 north and 70 north results in completely different wind speeds. In this example, the geostrophic wind at 40 north is about 40 knots, but that same spacing at 70 north gives you a geostrophic wind speed of just about 23 knots, so quite a marked difference. We can use this geostrophic wind scale to work out how windy it will be at any location on the map. So let's say we're going to pass south of Portlandville and we want to predict the wind that's going to be existing when we get there. Now conveniently enough we're going to be passing at the exact time this chart is valid for and the first thing to note in order to use the scale is our latitude which in this case is almost exactly 50 degrees north. Now if you're using electronic planning tools or paper charts, finding your latitude is simple, so I'm not covering that here. So looking at our location, we simply measure as accurately as we can, maybe using the edge of a piece of paper and marking with a pencil where each isobar crosses it, the distance between two isobars, and as close as we can to perpendicular to those isobars. We then transpose that distance up to the geostrophic wind scale. And we then move up till we find the point on that scale as close as possible representing our latitude. In this case, for simplicity, I've made it exactly 50 degrees north. We can see here that that gives us a geostrophic wind speed of 40 knots. There are a couple of adjustments to make to this before we find the wind we can expect off Portland Bill, though. The first is surface friction. Now, the geostrophic wind scale is based on 600 metres above the surface rather than at the surface. There's a good reason for this. It's because the surface of the Earth varies greatly from place to place. So a smooth ice cap at one extreme or a city with tightly packed skyscrapers at the other, they have massively differing friction. So in order to avoid the complications of the surface and have a simpler model for this scale, they simply use a height at which the friction effect is negligible and they've chosen 600 metres or 2,000 feet above the surface. Now over land and sea, friction effects reduce the geostrophic wind and also change its direction. And over land, this effect changes diurnally, in other words, during the day. So we would have to alter the friction compensation according to whether it's day or night. Over the sea, however, there's much less friction, and so diurnal variations are small enough that we tend to ignore them. So over the sea, all we need to do to account for friction is to factor the geostrophic wind by about 
In this case, the geostrophic wind scale gave us a speed of 40 knots, so factoring or multiplying by 0.7, we get a speed of 28 knots. The next adjustment is to account for the effect of centrifugal force and find the wind actually created by the pressure gradient, and this is known as the gradient wind. The pressure gradient pushes air in towards an area of low pressure. Now in the Northern Hemisphere, the effect of Coriolis, which is covered excellently elsewhere on YouTube, so I won't spend time on that here either, is to cause the wind to almost turn 90 degrees right and to circulate around a low pressure anti-clockwise. Now obviously the reverse happens in the Southern Hemisphere and it ends up going clockwise around a low. On the other hand, air is pushed out from a high pressure area towards areas of lower pressure. And in the Northern Hemisphere, Coriolis makes it turn almost 90 degrees right and circulate around the high pressure clockwise. And once again, that's reversed in the Southern Hemisphere. Now this obviously helps us to work out the wind direction because the isobars pretty much approximate to the wind direction. But it also helps us identify the centrifugal force adjustment that's needed. Now centrifugal force causes objects to accelerate away from the center of the arc they are describing. So it always makes the air move away from the center of a high or low around which it's flowing. Around a high then, the air is naturally moving away from the center of the system and centrifugal force adds to this, slightly increasing the wind speed relative to a fixed point on the surface. Around a low, the air is moving towards the center of the system and centrifugal force works in the opposite direction, slightly decreasing the wind speed relative to a fixed point on the surface. Our point off Portland Bill is in a low pressure system, so we need to reduce the wind by about three or four knots to account for this. Now this adjustment is actually dependent on the geostrophic wind speed and the radius of curvature among a couple of other variables, but this approximation is close enough for sailing purposes. Deducting this leaves us with a surface wind of about 25 knots. Now we know the geostrophic wind was about 10 knots more than the surface wind, so any gusts can't possibly take us above that margin. So I would predict that the surface wind will be about 25 knots, gusting up to 35. And based on the isobar wind direction, I'll say the wind will be from the west-southwest. The tidal race around Portland Bill is pretty fierce. Now in this real world example, it's peaking at about five knots, about 1.5 nautical miles south of the bill. Unsurprisingly, with the geography here also creating eddies and back currents, this area is known for pretty fierce white water. On top of that, if you were to try to go through here on a following tide, you'd need to add the speed of the tide to the wind speed because they're in direct opposition to each other. So the relative wind on the surface of the water will be the 25 knots of wind plus 5 knots of tide, giving you a relative speed of 30 knots. If you wonder what this looks like, check out any of the many videos on YouTube of the Portland race. They really are quite spectacular. However, with the tide running the other way, it peaks at 5 knots but in the same direction as the wind. Now, the relative wind is equal to the wind speed minus the speed of the tide, so a much more manageable 20 knots. The energy of the air is proportional to the square of its speed, so the effects are proportional to the square too. Now 20 squared is 400, while 30 squared is 900, so increasing the relative wind by 50% from 20 to 30 knots increases the energy that it impacts onto the sea surface, i.e. by creating waves, by a whopping 125%. This rather salt-flecked screenshot is from a passage from Lyme Regis to Pool. The speed over the ground, or SOG, was maintained at around 11 knots for almost an hour and a half by using the anti-clockwise tidal flow around Portland Bill. Now, as you can see here, we went within one and a half miles of the bill with more than four knots of tide under us, and with a geostrophic wind scale showing 26 knots, you might have feared that this would not be safe. However, by the time friction and centrifugal force have been accounted for and the tidal set deducted, the predicted relative wind was just 15 knots, which made the predicted sea state workable and, using the race, would make for a very swift rounding of the bill. The sea state was, as expected, benign. Now please, exercise great caution if you try and do this. 
in waters you aren't very familiar with. In this case, we were familiar with the area and we closed with the bill gradually as we approached, monitoring it visually as we did to make sure we didn't get caught out and always had an escape plan in mind, um, turning 90 degrees away from the bill and increasing our offing by several miles in case our calcula calculations proved to be incorrect. Well, that's it for today. In two weeks, we'll be looking at how to use the geostrophic wind scale to predict the movement of fronts and plan accordingly. If you found this video useful, please do subscribe. Please do give us a like. That really helps us develop the channel. And if you hit that bell icon, you'll get notified the next time we post a video. Look forward to seeing you again soon on The Boat Sheet. <music>